Um, so first of all, hello everyone and hello to all of our panelists. I know that for some of you, it is uh, dinner time or incredibly late. <laughs> um, so I really, really appreciate um, you all being here today. Um, as we were just talking about with Nancy, this event is part of the USIS's International Career Toolkit Series, um, which is a series of events uh, designed to help PIT students who are interested in international careers. Um, and these events uh, sort of do everything from talking with global professionals um, to talking to what we're doing today, PIT alumni with their experience um, experiences in global education, um, to creating workshops on resumes and cover letters. Um, so anything that you might be interested in um, post-graduation in a global sense. That is sort of what these events are, are designed to help you with. Um, we have events like this throughout the academic year. Um, so uh, do keep an eye out for these. Um, I find them uh, really uh, useful and illuminating and, and, and hopefully helpful for students as well. So with all that being said, um, today, we are going to talk about attending graduate school away from the U.S. Um, so we are joined today by a wonderful panel of Pitt faculty, staff, and alumni um, who all have experience with global education in some capacity um, and can chat about the experience of applying for and attending graduate school abroad or working with students who are interested in, um, in, in that experience. Um, just a note, we will have a question and answer session probably in the last 10, 15 minutes or so. So do jot down your questions, put them in the question box, keep them in your head to use on mic, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, but we want to make sure that this is as productive and useful uh, of, of an hour as, as possible. So do come with, um, with some questions if you have them. So to begin, um, I'd love for all of the panelists to just introduce ourselves uh, and talk about why we either decided to go to graduate school abroad, and if we are in graduate school abroad, maybe what we're studying, where we're studying, and you know why we decided to do that, um, or uh, what our experiences are working with students who are interested in graduate school um, in, in general, um, just to get a sense of who's here and, and what we're going to, um, to talk about. So I thought we could start with um, with Akuto. So Akuto, if you want to start introducing, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Akuto McGee. I'm right now a PhD researcher at Maastricht University in the south of the Netherlands. Um, but I also did my master's degree at the University of Amsterdam in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, and right now my research just focuses on uh, the way that civil society in Poland actually has responded to threats to the rule of law and human rights under the current government. Um, and so obviously I started my study abroad journey uh, with my master's degree, and that was more because I actually studied German language and cultural studies, and I was involved in the uh, Global Studies Center. And so I, I really already thought I was going to go abroad and I'd already started to develop some of the skills to go abroad. So for me, that was just the next uh, logical step. Although I did not end up going to Germany, I ended up going to the Netherlands, which is another uh, story. Um, but I was looking for an abroad experience. Also, because I applied to the university directly a bit uh, less, I was looking forward to paying less tuition as well. Uh, this is a very practical matter. So this is also part of the reason uh, that I started my journey abroad. And it's nice to see everybody today. Yeah, thank you so much. You have had a lot of experience abroad with your master's and now your PhD, so you are dedicated. I like it. <laughs> um, Oliver, if you want to go next, that'd be great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Oliver Ja. I'm uh, reporting in from Kyoto, Japan. It's uh, past midnight here. So if I seem a little tired, I apologize for that in advance. But um, yeah, no, my, uh, I also had a very similar path with studying abroad. So um, in my third year at Pitt, I went to Japan for the first time. I was actually here for 15 months because I did an internship and uh, the study abroad program that the, the university offered. So that really gave me my first taste of uh, life abroad. And uh, it really cemented my desire to continue that after I finished uh, at Pitt. So I came back for my fourth year. And then basically, as soon as I like uh, hit the ground in the fourth year, I started applying for master's programs abroad. And so um, my field is international relations and specifically Japan, North Korea relations, which is a hot geopolitical topic. So I've always it's always been relevant to the news. There's always been things to research and study. So um, I did a, a master's uh, at Ritsa Mekon University in Kyoto. And I was very lucky because I got the MEX scholarship, which uh, provided for my entire tuition. They paid for the plane ticket and they even gave me a monthly stipend. 
And then even luckier than that, I was able to extend that to a PhD, which is what I'm doing now. So I'm in like the third year of the third year of funding. And uh, we'll see if it'll take longer for me to finish the PhD, but I'm pretty set on continuing my academic career in Japan. So I'm going to start looking for academic jobs next year. And uh, when I finish my PhD, continue uh, my path here. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, I am also a PhD student, so I'm in solidarity with both of you right now. It is it is hard out there. And I can imagine uh, the, the difficulties of, of doing it abroad are, are unique to that particular experience. So thank you for that. Um, Nancy, if you want to jump in with some of your experiences working with students and, and some sort of general thoughts on this topic. Nancy, I think you're muted right now if you want to unmute yourself. Sorry, I'll try to keep my com comments focused because otherwise I'll fall into all of those questions that you you sent us and, and we wanna to get to those later. Um, I did part of my graduate study at Leningrad State University in the Soviet Union, um, part of it in East Germany, uh, G German Democratic Republic um, in the city of Rostock. And then uh, in the later part of graduate school, I, I was at Moscow State University um, and I think what motivated me to do that was the correct perception that we speak Russian terribly, <laughs> U.S. you know, born uh, people that are not native speakers. And I came to realize if I'm ever going to be any good at this, I actually have to live over there. And of course, the Iron Curtain was a bit of an obstacle. But once you make up your mind, there are people in this country that will help you get through those obstacles. And, and it was an investment vastly worth making in terms of my my fluent, my proficiency in the language. I can't tell you how much it helped me to be proficient in Russian in terms of the, the decades that followed. Yeah, and I know I can extend this question to Akuto and uh, and and Oliver about um, foreign language uh, and what it's like to um, be in uh, be uh, studying um, in not your native language um, and and what that experience is like and if that was a motivating factor to to studying it. Very similar to what Nancy was saying, like I wanted to be proficient in this language. Going to study in this place is really going to help with that. Um, can you speak to some of your experiences with with that in particular? Um, uh, <laughs> go ahead, Dean, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I think it's really uh, echoing what Nancy said. So obviously I did take uh, German when I was at Pitt. And um, before that, as a child, for instance, I had French and Spanish. I think this is also quite typical of the U.S. You usually have Spanish or another language uh, in, in school. But there's definitely a huge difference between learning for a course and for a grade and to speak with other people who are non-native speakers and maybe your native speaking teacher or teachers and actually living in the country. Um, I found that I, I struggled a lot more with the language and just pronunciation and proficiency was a lot weaker in the U.S. And in contrast, I learned Dutch in two years and now I can speak fluently on my research on complex topics um, because you're just surrounded by it all the time. Um, and I definitely think it has very huge advantages. I mean, intellectually advantages, uh, socially advantages that you can talk with your neighbors, that if you get a letter in the mail from the government asking you to do something or a bill, you can immediately just read it and you don't have to uh, struggle to know what's going on. In terms of just CV competencies and looking for work both in that country or abroad, it's quite helpful. Uh, and it also helps with other languages. So I definitely think this is a, a really big advantage of going abroad if you're going to a non-English speaking or whatever your native language is, if it's different than your native language. Um, and I definitely would encourage anybody, even if you think, oh, everyone's, a lot of people speak English in the Netherlands. It's the uh, country with the most proficient English knowledge outside of the non-English speaking world. Um, but I think even when you have those kind of situations, or even if you think, oh, well, this language is really difficult to learn, or, I think you should still really try to learn the language because it just gives so much back to you. Um, and being surrounded by the language all the time and adverts on television with your neighbors, with passersby, it just it really helps so much uh, your speed of learning the language. Um. 
Uh, yeah, I'll to chime in. I concur completely. I definitely agree that um, you definitely should, as much as you can, study the language before you go to your target country. And um, I was lucky because so I've been studying Japanese for about 10 years. And um, well, Asian languages take much longer. I think Slavic languages take much longer than uh, Romance languages and a lot of other European languages. But no matter what language you're studying, really just start early and do as much as you can. And um, it's not entirely required, but I would recommend that if you're an undergrad, if you're a first or a second year, consider going abroad for a semester or two um in your target language in your target country because that'll give you like a an indication of sort of like a taste of what life is like over there are you going to be adjusted to the culture and uh yeah because i've been studying japanese for such a long time i'm pretty used to it by now uh, my speaking is a uh, perfectly fine listening is fine uh, writing is like a bit harder especially for asian languages but um luckily the program that i'm, I'm in at ritz uh you, you can do your re uh, your um final thesis in english um which is fine anyways because um you want as many people to read it as possible in the end if you write it in like your target language um it's going to limit like how much people are going to read it so um if you're i would just say like if you're afraid of like writing your thesis like in that target language it's not always necessarily required but it really depends on your university I just want to say one other thing, um, and that is that, you know, the sad truth is that people make snap judgments about us, you know, often within the first 10 seconds of listening to us, and they decide whether you're smart or not, whether you're worth talking to or not. And I can't convince somebody within those first 10 seconds that I have an adequate understanding of Habermas's model of democracy in mid 20th century, it takes longer than 20 sec to 10 seconds even to say it. But I can within 20 10 seconds be brilliant in their language with colloquialisms and proverbs and syntax and so forth. And what that says to them is not that I put in, not only that I put in labor, but also that they could hang out with me and not be, you know, burdened with somebody who's stuttering along, you know, being inarticulate in their language, which could, you know, is, is terrible to say, but it's kind of boring for them. So to the extent that, you know, people don't necessarily care about us and make such snap decisions, you want that snap decision to be something that you can definitely show where you have excelled and, and fluency and to be interesting in a foreign language is an incredible advantage. And I imagine too that that is especially useful. I mean, you talk about Habermas, but it's incredibly useful when you are in graduate school and you're doing more complex work and you have to have more complicated conversations yeah. in general because of what you're studying. So having more of a proficiency in the language can surely help you have more of these like academic, particularly for those of us who are doing our PhD, uh, more academic, more higher level conversations, just being able to sort of use the language to, to our benefit, I, I'm sure is, is really helpful for that as well. Um, yeah. So kind of along these same lines, I'm also interested in um, uh, sort of the, the academic styles of your institutions. Obviously these things work differently outside of the US. So um, in addition to um, getting proficiency with the language, I'm also interested in how you navigated just a new academic system, a new uh, cultural system um, in, uh, in, in, in higher education. I did my, um, my master's degree in London, which has a, a much more one-to-one um, -one with the US, but I still found uh, uh, some difficulties in getting used to how grading worked, how assessment worked, even like academic years and, and sort of calendars, um, a, a little bit hard to adjust because I was so stuck in sort of higher education in the U.S. So when I'm working, you know, over the summer, because that's the way that my master's program worked, I was like, oh, I don't have that mental break that I've sort of you know, filtered into all years of my academic career. So I'm wondering if any of you can speak to some of, uh, some of those differences or things that surprised you or, or how you navigated that. Um, well, I guess uh, the one thing is, is like, uh, look at the resources that the, the program offers you. Uh, definitely do like research into the program that you're doing. So for example, at Ritz and Macon, where I'm at, uh, they offer like different types of programs, depending on like what field you're in and, you know, uh, who your advisor is. And I think um, from the very beginning, establishing a good rapport with like your advising professor is going to be very important of whether you sink or swim for uh, not just the first semester, but for the entire program. So definitely make sure that you're on the same page with like your researcher, or the person who's in charge of a research because at the end of the day he's the he or she is going to be the one who's going to decide you know can you continue with your research can you um is this going to be something that we can publish uh are you going to be fine for the rest of the course so definitely i think establish those friendships and relationships early if you can uh 
Um, I don't think I really struggled uh, to adjust at all. I think maybe uh, just going off of what Oliver said is just try to find the resources that are available to you. I think quite a lot of universities actually are, are very welcoming to international students and do actually try to source international talent. So there are quite a few resources for how to manage this, how to handle this. I mean, for instance, I have some colleagues at Nordic universities and there are even resources for people who don't come from Nordic countries with how to deal with long hours of darkness uh, when you're studying or trying to stay motivated or something like this. So I think there, there are a lot of resources out out there um, also you know um, sorry countries tend to have their own websites for education so I think those who studied uh, German would know the day a day of a D A A D or a study in what used to be called study in Holland but Holland is not all the Netherlands so now it's called study in Netherlands um, these kind of websites that get you used to things like what is grading how your uh, scores your international scores be adjusted or understood in this context what does it mean when you get this particular grade and of course really just trying to talk to your your peers and your professors uh, really helps uh, for instance the Dutch grading system there are just some grades that you almost are never awarded very low and very high they just you never really awarded them so you might get a grade and think well I did everything perfect why did I not get a 10 out of 10 why did I get a 9 or an 8.5 but actually that's amazing that's fantastic um, just really small things like that that you wouldn't know unless you just kind of colloquially talk with people and they mention oh yeah nobody ever gets a 10 don't worry about this or wow you got a 9 this is really great um, I think that that really helps yeah, and I would only add that um, when you're studying abroad, um, don't underestimate the value of just hanging out with people. Um, not only are you working on your language skills, but you're also um, more likely to be to have a context within which you can ask questions about things that you don't understand. So it's kind of that hanging out is not wasting time the way it might be in this country. You know, I don't often let myself hang out that much here because I don't have the time to do it. But there, it, it was at least double duty, you know, working on the language skills, but also picking, a asking, you know, let people know around you that you're completely at sea. You don't have a clue how something's done and they'll explain it to you. We have a, a PhD student, one of our smartest ever PhD students here at Pitt in the Slavic department. And I walked in one to the department one day when um, another PhD student, a US citizen, was explaining to him what a checkbook was, going over the little tabs one by one and saying, you put this here and then you put this here. And he had never seen a checkbook before. Somebody as brilliant as he and as well educated as he nevertheless had never encountered a checkbook. And the way he was learning about it was just hanging out in the department, you know, and he said, what's this thing here? What is this for? You know, so you can pick up really vital information that you don't even know you're missing until you get yourself into a pickle. So hanging out with your people, I think, is really important. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And again, I, I went to to grad school in London um, where um, uh, th there was more of a, a sort of a cultural familiarity for me, but even things like I didn't know how to use the underground, you know, and I didn't know how to, uh, you know, get a train up to Birmingham where I did a lot of research and um, just, uh, just having those connections with students, uh, just like just normal things, like not even anything to do with, with academia to, to Nancy's point, just like, just how you live a day-to-day -day life. You know, like I learned that if you want to not spend as much money on groceries, you go to Sainsbury's, you don't go to Waitrose, you know, and it's only something you really learn um, being really entrenched in the culture and, and really getting to, to know people. Um, and, and so I guess that that's uh, that leads into some of my other questions about being an international student. Akuto, you sort of um, referred to this a little bit, but that a lot of universities do have um, some resources for international students. And so I'm wondering about um, the international communities at your universities. Um, if you have made connections with other people who are also international students, um, what kind of unique opportunities are sort of available to you as an international student? Or even more generally, what are some unique opportunities you've had at your graduate school that you couldn't have had if you were to study something similar um, in, in the US? Um, well, in uh, Japan, for like most uh, universities, they offer a variety of different clubs to participate in. So um, that's definitely a, a that's definitely a good thing to like uh, meet other people. And um, I did like attend some things like in my master's program because I had more free time then. But as a PhD student, as you know, you're much more busy, so you have less time to do that sort of thing. But um, if you're doing like a master's program, uh, especially in the beginning, I think the first semester is the best time to meet people to see what's out there. Um, I also recommend attending like seminars and stuff that are maybe. Really 
related to your research or even just tang tangentially related because inevitably you're going to meet people that have similar interests and then from there that's how you can like you know uh, make friends and you know make uh, colleagues and um, here in Japan at least uh, the bar culture and the drinking culture is very big here so going to have like a drink with like your professor with like other students that's very much a thing here and social opportunities like that I think are very important for um, you sort of adapting to like your new culture. Uh, maybe just to add then, uh, I think, oops, I think really anywhere you go, there are always, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's a, a group on campus that posts a flyer somewhere, there are always these little communities of like women in Maastricht or, uh, you know, um, so-called expats or migrants in the Netherlands or something like this that you can always find. Um, I would definitely encourage students really just to uh, maybe like, I'll ever try to reach out to people who have maybe your shared interests. Uh, not necessarily somebody who's the same nationality or who's also uh, an immigrant or a migrant, because I think sometimes you, I often find outside of the U.S. anyway that people are extremely welcoming to internationals um, and are extremely kind and really patient, even if you want to meet for like an hour to learn the language a little bit, even if you can't speak really well, or if you just want to take a walk or just get out of your office or something like this. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily uh, limit yourself to a particular community. Maybe it can be based on an activity that you enjoy or something like this. Um, but there are just so many groups out there. And there are also just groups out there, you know, who do things like, oh, sometimes people want to do a Thanksgiving or a Halloween and they feel really left out and really sad or they don't know where to buy things or they want to have, recreate a meal from their home country or from a particular culture that has very a lot of shared meal elements. So I think these things are actually really quite easy to find, whether it's just on a poster somewhere or on social media. Um, and as for the kind of experiences, I think especially if you are studying something that is very regional, so maybe like, uh, for instance, geopolitical situation in Eastern Europe or something, if you are there in that place, you can meet so many more experts, experts who also might not make it to the West so much, one, because of visa and travel restrictions, cost, time, um, but also if they are mostly publishing in their language, maybe you don't come across their research as much. So I think just in terms of networking and being uh, close to the subject matter, I, I think this is something that I really gained. Um, and also just, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll stop there. But yeah. I also wonder, um, one of the things that I like about not only studying abroad during the time when I did it, but also just um, um, when I'm teaching abroad, and I suspect that I see that Allison is online and Molly and Elaine, I suspect that they would have their own stories that might resonate with this. It was such a relief to leave your country behind, you know, with all its sorrows and irreconcilable issues and its guns and its anger and its rage and its risks, you know, to turn your back on it and go and live in somebody else's problems for six months was a tremendous uh, psychological release for me not to have to worry about the United States. You know, the Speaker of the House, it'll resolve itself without Nancy, probably. Um, and I'll come back and find out who it is. But to leave your country is a tremendous sense of just you know, shoving off a huge burden and, you know, watching somebody else twist in the wind with their domestic problems. It's an interesting way to spend time. Yeah. And I mean, to, to some of our conversations earlier, it's about immersion, right? Like to, mm -hmm. to leave your own country is to be really immersed and, and to really dedicate yourself to like learning more about this culture, learning more about these people. And, uh, and I think that to a lot of our conversation, going to graduate school is a really good way of, of being able to, to do that. Um, so I guess my next question is a little more um, technical. It's about the application process and kind of all of the, the nitty gritty business stuff. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in just the basic application. How was that different um, than applying to maybe similar institutions in the U.S.? Um, and then if it wasn't, um, how did you go about things like student visas and housing and, you know, financing your time over there? Um you know, when you study abroad uh, in graduate school, Akuda mentioned um, that it's a little bit less expensive occasionally. Um, and in my case, it was uh, a little less time than it would be for an equivalent program in the U.S. I went to a one-year master's program um, that would have been a two-year master's program in the U.S. So I'm spending less money just in general because it's a, it's one year less. Um, but, uh, but, but also, um, I would have more time to kind of go and do another program or get a job 
faster or, or things like that. Um, so in, in any case, um, uh, my question is about application process, funding, um, uh, scholarships, uh, student visas. Um, how did you navigate that process? Um, and are there any tips that you have for people who might need to navigate that process in the future? Because it can be quite stressful. I'll, I'll cede my time to Akudo and uh, Oliver because um, since I had gone to countries that were fairly high risk, um, we were very, very uh, controlled every step to the left or right. We had to give up our American passport. We had no access to it. Um, we couldn't exit. We had no exit visas, so we couldn't leave the country when bad things happened, like Chernobyl. We couldn't leave the country. Um, we were stuck. But the, the, I suppose the good side of that was that we were in lockstep. We had to do X only when X was permitted to be done. And so it streamlined it. So the rest of my, the time I'll see to Akudo and to Oliver. Um yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there, but I would say uh, the first uh, tip I have is start early and like look things up early. That's like the best, uh, the single biggest piece of advice I can give because, um, like I said, um, basically the day that I came back to America for the first time I studied abroad, I basically just started what graduate school programs are available, what are the deadlines, especially the initial ones. And um, I think it'll depend on each country, but at least in Japan, for stuff like either applying for a job at like a company or going to university, it takes at least a year, usually a year in advance. So, um, um, I got back into the U.S. at uh, August 2018, and I think uh, by the time I submitted my everything to apply to Ritz Macon to start in the fall of 2019, I believe it was like November 2018. So it's really like not that much uh, that amount of time, especially if like you're starting your fourth year at Pitt and like you're trying to decide if you want to do grad school next. Really start at the beginning of like your first semester and fourth year, even maybe end of third semester wouldn't hurt. Just at least be aware of what the deadlines are. And um in regards to the application process itself, um, again, it's going to depend on your university and your country. But for me, when I was applying for scholarships, the scholarship and the university were actually in the same application. So um, basically, that made the process a lot more streamlined, but it'll really depend on like what you're looking for. So, But I would recommend look at scholarships and graduate school programs at the same time and see how you can like synthesize both and uh, be aware of what the deadlines are. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with Oliver. And um, also be aware that you will probably need a visa or permits to attend your university. So you might have to actually go for the early bird deadlines so your university can apply for you. Um, so this is also something to pay attention with. And if, for instance, um, for some countries, in order to get a student visa, you need a other things like you need to prove that uh, somebody who makes a certain amount a year is able to financially uh, support you if you come into trouble um, or that you have the tuition that can be paid off or something like this. So these are all things that you want to make sure you have secured before you go too far in the process. Um, maybe also good to know the federal student aid. So the website for the U.S. government Department of Education um, also has a list of foreign universities that accept student loans. Um, so if you need help with paying the tuition there, even if it's less, it's, it's still money. Um, if you need help for paying with books for books or housing, this is also something to pay attention to and also to make sure that the deadlines there are aligning with the deadlines for the application for the university. Um, and also for the visa and everything like that, I mostly just went through the university. I definitely recommend going through the university when possible. Uh, I think maybe sometimes if you miss a deadline, you might have to do a bit more on your own. Um, but I, I think it's best for the university. Also the same for housing. Uh, this is also because depending on the country, you may not have the opportunity to visit and look at housing options. So you might be paying for housing upfront and sight unseen. And also because a lot of international students tend to go to st certain student cities uh, in terms of things like scams or really strange things that anybody from X country, for instance, in Luxembourg and in the Netherlands, you can rent an apartment with no floor, <laughs> no lights, just wires hanging from the ceilings. And this is quite normal and people quite like to, to put in their own floors and things like that. So that even just really small things that are not necessarily a scam, you can rent an apartment thinking, oh, this is a great apartment, it's quite cheap. And you come in and there's just no floor and you <laughs> have to figure out how to do this. So I, I think for all these reasons, it's quite nice just to go uh, through the university who also tends to buy larger housing um, options so it's a bit cheaper uh, for you as well and uh, I took a break between both my uh, master or before both my master and my PhD program mostly because I, I also send money to my family in Nigeria so I want to work so I can send money to them and, and not be in school the whole time um, so I think even if you miss the first deadline or you feel a little bit slow also keep in mind that it's never too late and there are also quite a lot of non-traditional students especially 
uh, doing my PhD. There are some people who are in their 20s or some people who are in their 40s. So I think don't feel like it's too late um, if you need to take a break or if you change your mind or something like this. Yeah, I think all of that is is great advice and, and really resonates with my personal experiences as well um, in terms of the visa and with um, with housing, I went through my university, it, they just streamlined the process in a way that like going through all of these websites and difficult to understand, like processes were, were, were hard. Um, I know that for Kings, they had a particular, like, I mean, at, at, at the time it was a Facebook group. I, I think now it's just like part of their system where it was just like international students who are also looking for roommates. Um, I think Pitt has something like that for, for international students. I think it's a pretty typical, um, uh, process at, at this point. Um, but then um, I also lived uh, abroad longer than I was there for um, for uh, for my university. And so at that point, I was there. I was really familiar with, um, with the places that I wanted to live. And I had friends that I could live with. And so after a period of time, I could just go actually do the apartment hunting and apartment shopping. Um, that was really hard to do um, initially. Um, I would get, you know, I would email people um, who had flats in London um, and they would just send me like weird camera like videos on their phone like of of like these awful apartments I would never live in but I'm like well maybe I'm not there maybe it's better than I think um, but some things I wouldn't even think about like I would have to I when I was looking for flats not at a university I was like well it needs to be a fully furnished place because I don't plan on staying here um, so I don't want to spend all my money on like getting a you know furniture or a bed or things that I'm not ever gonna uh, like travel again with me. Um, so I think those things are like weird things that you don't really consider until you're actually like in that process. I do want to say too, I'm going to put, uh, pop this into the chat box. Um, I found a, a list of uh, various um, scholarship opportunities um, from Georgetown and University of Nebraska Lincoln. They have a, a large list of different scholarships for people who are interested in studying abroad. Um, a lot of these scholarships are for particular places. So if you want to study in Beijing, you could probably find a scholarship for that um, here. Um, so I'm going to just pop that in here for people to sort of peruse. Um, and like Akuto said uh, about um, sort of government funding, that's how I financed my study abroad. Um, I got a graduate plus loan, which also offered a stipend, which allowed me to sort of like pay for food and, and things like that. So um, those are always options as well. Um, so I guess my, uh, my next question would be about... Um, your degree and how it is recognized by US institutions. This is something that I had a lot of anxiety about when I was studying abroad as someone who wanted to return to the US to do my PhD. Um, I was worried that um, what I studied uh, abroad uh, wouldn't necessarily transfer like credit wise or that the experience um, wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't be legitimized by other US institutions. So I'm wondering what your experiences are with that, what research you did, um, if you want to stay abroad anyway, um, so it doesn't really matter, or get a, a, a career abroad and sort of those sorts of issues. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what your experiences are with, um, with those. My short um, answer is I didn't think about it. I just did it. I figured it would sort itself out. Uh, yeah, not, uh, pretty much not the same thing uh, with me. It's just like I focused more on just like getting the degree and like doing the research I wanted, re regardless of, you know, uh, what would happen after. But I mean, I'm focusing on like having an academic career in Japan. And thankfully, Ritsume Aikon University is pretty well regarded uh, in Japan. So um, by just university reputation alone, I don't think that's going to really affect me here. But if you are more focused on having like a, a career in the US or maybe even some other third country, look at the reputation of the university, I guess, see how it's ranked and and uh, do that research before you apply for anything. And I think that should factor into your decision of what institution you choose to study at. Um, I plan to stay abroad. So for me, this is not uh, as big of a, an issue. Um, but I have noticed also just having family uh, from abroad as well, that a lot of medical fields, like in nursing, even if you become a doctor abroad, um, some it's not that the U.S. does not recognize your degree, but they may require you to do some kind of additional test or uh, something like this when you come back to the U.S. to work. Um, so I would also pay attention to this. I think this is also the same, actually, if you do any kind of skilled programs or some kind of program where you need a permit or you need to pass a series of tests to get a license or something like this. 
Um, and I don't think it's necessary that it's not necessarily that it's not recognized in the U.S., but I think often you have to take some kind of booster course or training or recertify or something like this in the U.S. So this is uh, something to keep an eye on. Um, but I, I think this is going away a bit, or I hope this is going away a bit. There are quite a lot of like visiting professorship programs and visiting scholar programs. Um, so I think that the idea is that these degrees are equivalent, um, except the degree requirements are wildly different. Um, so hopefully this is becoming less of an issue, but always worth checking to see if you have to recertify or, or get some kind of license or something like this that's relevant just to the U.S. market. Yeah, I, I I think that's all like that, like Nancy and, and Oliver, I also kind of didn't think about it. I was like, well, that's later Crystal's problem. <laughs> we will figure that out eventually. Uh, but Akuda makes a really good point that depending on the field that you're interested in, um, you might want to double check on particular requirements or particular certifications just to make sure that um, when when you return to the US, if that's something you want to do, um, uh, that, that you can uh, still pursue the career that you want to pursue with the education that you have. Um, and I do agree. I you see more of a, a shifting trend in, in, in more acceptance from sort of international careers and international studies in general. Um, and so I, I guess that uh, I want to kind of circle back to a more broad question, which is, what advice do you have for people um, for choosing programs um, that they might want to be interested in or that they might want to uh, attend? Because, you know, there are a lot of universities out there and there's a lot of international universities that sometimes in the same place, there can be multiple different um, programs um, that even for me, I did my master's in Shakespeare studies, which London is like the perfect place to do it. But there's also like 15 programs like that, which you don't have in the US, but like in that country alone or in that city alone, there were all of these programs that were all offering very similar things. And so um, if there is a student uh, in, in, you know, in the session today who wants to go to a particular program, knows they want to go abroad, um, what are some tips or advice you have for like choosing a program or um, things that they can go about to choosing the right program for them? Um, I would say, um, pretend you could do anything you want. It probably won't turn out that way, but it will give you a good start. Like imagine, think greedily. If you could do anything you want, what would you do? And then act as if you're gonna be able to do that, follow that path as far as it takes you and um, and just pretend as if it's gonna be fine. And maybe it will turn out to be fine. You know, you don't know. But I, I, I found for me, it was always reassuring to tell myself, I can always get out of this. I can always not go if nobody has a gun to my head. So I can pretend, you know, as long as I want. This is just pretend. This is just a dress rehearsal. This is just practicing. And then uh, the further I get on the path, the more I discover, actually, I could do, I could do this. I put all this work into it. I could. I, now it's not so scary anymore. So uh, pretending, although it's kind of, a counter, um, it's not the greatest psychological advice. I found that it stood me in very good stead to pretend I'm not really gonna do it. I'm just gonna, you know, go down the path and see where it takes me. Yeah, I would say uh, make a plan and expect your plan to change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's uh, very unlikely that the, what you're gonna do like later on is gonna 100% match up what you set out to do. So for example, like I wanted to study uh, the connection between Koreans in Japan and North Korea, cause there are like sponsored schools in Japan that are sponsored by North Korea. But um, eventually like uh, after discussing with my professor, he kind of said, this is more sociology rather than international relations. So I ended up talking about uh, Shinzo Abe's North Korea policy, the former prime minister. So like the North Korea element was still there, but it's a completely different topic uh, related to that. So stuff like that your research topic and like um you know what's going to happen with that that can change at any time and uh, it's perfectly natural and pretty much expected for it to change but um besides that i would also as i said earlier make sure that you have a good professor that they can uh you know again give you constantly good feedback on your research and is supportive and uh can you know uh push you in the right direction of what you need to do because your whole graduate school experience it really does depend on like the relationship between you and the faculty because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to give you the degree. And so you want to work with them as closely as you can. And so when you're applying for school, see if you can find somebody whose research interests match up with yours and go from there. Uh, yeah, I would echo some of what's being said, especially what Oliver just said. Um, maybe it's also important to look at which programs go through the topics that you find interesting or offer course uh, offers that you find interesting or look at whose research you find interesting, uh, especially if you're in a bit of a niche area. Um, and I'll also put in the chat, I, 
actually, when I was beginning my search for the University of Amsterdam, or before I went to do my master's, I used this website. Um, although I didn't end up using their sponsored links or whatever, I just searched the different programs and then I just went to the universities um, themselves. There are just so many resources for if you want to study X, uh, X thing in this place, um, or if you want to study this topic, which universities offer this opportunity. Uh, day a uh, day, like I mentioned uh, earlier, also has a, a little search thing where you can look at what field you want to study. Of course, you want to study how much it should cost, if it's charging tuition, or things like that. Um, so I think these are also helpful ways to find programs. And LinkedIn has a feature for people who went to your university who are doing things that maybe you also want to do or who are working jobs that you find interesting. So you can also use that. And I find that people really love to talk about the research and their experiences. Um, so you can just email a complete stranger who just went to your university and say, hey, I saw you went uh, to my university and you you have my dream job. I would really like to know about your experience at X University. And what did you think? Um, and maybe just a really small but technical detail, if you want to stay abroad or if you think you don't want to go back to the U.S. Um, and you have a choice of doing things in different countries, maybe it's also worth considering what the migration or, or immigration uh, requirements are for this country. Um, for instance, uh, and maybe Oliver, this is maybe something that you also have experienced with, uh, trying to work in the EU as a non-EU citizen. Yeah, it really requires that you have a job that is extremely needed or that you are very highly educated and have a lot of competencies that you wouldn't necessarily need to have in the U.S. So it can be quite difficult and it may be a bit frustrating and tedious. So if you see the same offering as offered in two programs, except one program is in a country that's much easier to immigrate to and to stay in, then maybe that country is a little bit more attractive uh, than the other. Yeah, and I would also say, bear in mind that um, very often your professors here at Pitt, um, like everybody else in the world, they've got too much to do. They're dropping deadlines. There are letters of recommendation that are overdue. They haven't started yet and so forth. And so they tend to be passive with respect to you unless you speak up. Uh, if I had to check with every one of my PhD students, I wouldn't get anything done. And so I have to rely on them coming to me with a specific concern or worry or question. And when they do that, I have all the time in the world for them. I can uh, have a quick Zoom call if that's what's necessary. We can go out for a beer if that works better. We could do whatever. But if I don't hear from them, I don't go looking for stuff to do. I'm already, I'm already in the doghouse with too many things already. But I don't mind a bit if they broach something to me. So you know, be sure that you take the active role in that. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, even what you were saying earlier, Nancy, and what everyone's talking about, there's a little bit of bravery that comes along with like going about this process um, and, and a lot of vulnerability, right? Whether you're going to a place where you don't speak the native language or you want to just learn about a program you're interested in and you are just going to kind of cold email people. There's a lot of vulnerability and, and, and bravery that goes along with that. Um, and, and it can, but I do agree that like just open communication with people who are interested, um, in the same career as you are, or have gone to the same school that you might want to pursue is, is really, um, is really key. I know that for me, I emailed faculty in the departments that I was interested in, and most of them were willing to talk to me. Um, and most of them were willing to tell me more about their requirements. And, you know, there were a couple of programs that I just shaved off my list after talking to people. I'm like, actually, I don't think this is a right fit for me. Or that faculty said, hey, listen, we're actually only accepting one international student this semester. And, you know, there's already someone in mind that you can get a lot of insight about the programs that you're interested in. Um, that you wouldn't necessarily get by just sort of looking at their um, their page online or something. Um, yeah, yeah, and bear in mind that for, for you may be an incredibly scary thing to do, such as to shoot an email to a faculty member saying, uh, could you spend 10 minutes talking to me? Uh, for them, it happens like three or four times a day. <laughs> you know, a couple of days ago, I was talking to some student in Iran that might come to our department in Slavic here at Pitt. Before that, somebody else in Moldova. And for me, it's not boring. It's just an or in my week includes that kind of stuff. It's ordinary for me and I can spare 10 minutes to talk mm -hmm. to them. It's, they're twisting in the wind going, you know, being neurotic about it. And there's no need to be that way. For for me, it's just an ordinary way to spend the week. The week. And so they should take some comfort in uh, how ordinary and ru routine it in fact is. 
Yeah. And then in, in, in that, then you just get all of the information you could possibly get and make mm-hmm. a really informed decision. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's key when you're making such a big choice is I'm not only going to like go to school abroad, I'm also going to live there and potentially work there, um, which leads me into my next question. And this is maybe specific to like students student visa stuff, but this is something that I was certainly interested in when I was studying abroad. And that's, are there opportunities for work abroad while you're also studying? Um, so does your visa allow you to do internships or to work part-time um, or, you know, just get other experiences outside of, of the academy um, and, and what your experiences are with that? Yeah, I had um, no experience because we had to, <laughs> when we had to leave, we had no choice but to leave. So I'll cede my time. Um, yeah, well, it depends on each country and the, the laws of each country. But in Japan, if you're on a student visa, you can only do 28 hours a week. So um, definitely you have to be conscious of that, of like how, what you can do. But I kind of took a bit of an unorthodox approach where I'm actually a freelance journalist in my spare time where I'm like published in like outlets like NK News, which is with uh, North Korea, The Spectator, uh, Asia Times, that sort of thing. So that's how I try to make a bit of money on the side. And um, I started a Substack, which is also like your own blog where you can also make money off of your writing. So that's been really good for supplemental income for me personally and um it's also good too because it's related to what i'm researching as well so um as i'm doing my research on the side i can like you know write like an op-ed piece or like a feature or some historical piece and um you know if you can make money off of that i think it's a good deal altogether but it's going to depend on you individually and what opportunities there are yeah the rules are pretty similar in the netherlands if you're a student, sorry, if you're a non-EU, non-EA, non-Turkish student, um, so like a U.S. citizen, for instance, um, you're allowed to work 20 hours during the week during the year or uh, full-time during the summer, not both, and you're not allowed to volunteer. So that is a bit uh, limited. That's also something you want to look up, uh, especially if you think, oh, I'll take it. You can do an internship if it's a part of your degree program. Um, so there were some master's degrees that had like six months, three months or something like this for an internship. So that is unlimited. That's a part of your degree program that doesn't count. Um, so it's maybe good to know that uh, if you're doing your PhD in the Netherlands, like a lot of European countries, actually, you are an employee, not, well, not a lot of Europeans. In the Netherlands, you're an employee, not a um, student. So not only are you paid to do your PhD, um, but you generally have a, um, a, a, what is this called? I don't know the English word, but it's a, a permit for scientific staff, basically. So you can work um, a lot of different places, although... In my case, because it's uh, funded and covered with an additional grant from the European Commission, it, I'm not, they don't want me to work uh, on something else and do my PhD. They want me to just focus on a PhD. Uh, this also includes an internship. So it might be possible that an internship, for instance, is worked into your plans. Um, it might be possible to do uh, an internship or some kind of freelance opportunity with a US based company from abroad. Um, maybe something like what Oliver is doing. I also did an internship with the US-based organization during my master's and made a little bit of money. So that also helps. But uh, I would say if you do have the opportunity to do a program where you also have an internship, I would definitely go for it, not just for the extra money, but also just for the work experience. Um, And a lot of jobs really value some kind of international intercultural work experience um, if you're able to achieve that. Yeah, that actually was my experience. My master's degree had opportunities for internships built into the degree. And I think similarly, um, the the status of a PhD researcher would be different. And so this was something that was really unique to getting a master's degree as opposed to getting a PhD there. Um, and this is a big reason why I applied to the program that I applied to, because I'm like, similar to what you're saying, I got work experience um, in addition to um, some extra cash, but also uh, in, in addition to getting my, my graduate graduate degree there as well, um, that I worked with, uh, with a theater in the UK that was like really interested in the kinds of things that was, I was already doing research on. And it was a very like practical internship, right? So all these things that I was like researching and like thinking about, I actually got to put into practice while I was, um, interning at the same time. And that is a big reason why I decided to go to that college as opposed to the 15 other colleges (laughs) that offered something similar. So, um, you know, that's something also to keep in mind when you are, um, when you're choosing programs. So Chris, so are you in theater arts or English or what, where exactly did you land here at Pitt? I'm, uh, I'm in English here at Pitt. 
Yeah. A grad so, PhD student in English. Is yeah, that exactly. Yeah. So I kind of, but a lot of my research rides the line between theater and English. Yeah. Um, but um, so I want to have some time for questions, but while people are sort of devising their questions, I first want to just ask a really broad question, which is what are the biggest challenges you face going to graduate school abroad? And what are sort of the, the biggest joys that you experience in, in going to graduate school abroad? I think getting sort of the, the, uh, both sides is really important. And again, for anyone who has a question, feel free to um, to to write it in the chat. And we'll also have a couple minutes after we answer too. For me, the greatest challenge was a fear that I wouldn't recognize myself, that I wouldn't know who I was out there. You know, I know who I am in this context in the United States, but I worried about being out there and being kind of lost at sea, not knowing who I was. And um I found that that was indeed true. I didn't know who I was, but it sorted itself out. A lot of things, if you don't really think about them very much, they work out fine. <laughs> it's my advice. Um, well, I think greatest challenge is just like focusing on like what comes next. Um, everyone is like different, but I'm always thinking of like the future of like, you know, what I'm going to do, what's going to, what are things going to be like three, six months, a year, five years from now? I'm always thinking like big picture ahead. So, um, I guess like the disadvantage of that is like it kind of like maybe takes you away from living in the moment. So I would definitely uh, recommend like, yeah, there is stuff in the future to worry about. And, you know, you will have to cross that bridge when you get to it. But, uh, you know, stop and smell the roses because, you know, as Ferris Bueller said. <laughs> so anyways, though, uh, yeah, enjoy the time that you have, because whether like you decide to like stay here permanently, like I'm trying to do or whether it's just for a couple of years, and you're going to go back. It's all valuable experience. And I think the benefit of like living in like, another country, speaking another language is you really do like uh, understand, you know, what it's like to be an immigrant, like in America, what it's like to um, be like a non-citizen of like a country and like uh, the challenges that faced is so. Um, one example that comes to mind is I recently had some lower back problems and I had to see like a doctor for that. And I could communicate in Japanese fine, but I'm thinking to myself, if I didn't speak the language, I'd be like in a way worse position. And who knows what could happen to me if I uh, couldn't communicate just for like basic health and daily life stuff. And so it's like that for everybody who's like a non-citizen in most other countries or who maybe it's not their first language. So having that humbling experience and, you know, gaining that, I think is very valuable and you can only get that from going abroad. Uh, yeah, so for me, I think I didn't experience a lot of challenges, um, which is kind of weird because I also started my PhD about two weeks before the first COVID lockdowns, so before you could no longer enter the country. So it was a very bizarre and chaotic time. Um, I think maybe the biggest difficulties or just minor frustrations, uh, kind of like what Oliver said, and, you know, just being new in a country. And especially before, I did speak German when I came here, and I do live in part of Netherlands where a lot of people also speak German, so this is not really terrible but just yeah not having the Dutch knowledge and just getting like letters in the mail that look like they came from the government and just being stressed out about well what does this exactly mean or I have to ask somebody I remember also the first month or so um you know I just hadn't seen someone in a really long time I arrived at the end of carnival which is uh, like a holiday season and the mostly traditionally Catholic part of the, uh, Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium. And uh, so everybody was on vacation and it was also COVID. So I only had a little bit of time in the office and I really had like not seen anyone, had not talked to anybody. And I really just broke down trying to figure out how to separate my trash because there were all these different websites and I couldn't understand them. And I one would not Google Translate. It was just a document and I didn't know how to get it translated. And I was just so frustrated. And, you know, there are all these tiny things that you just do like this because it's your country, your language, your culture, and you get it. And then suddenly you're in a new context where you don't get anything and just really basic things can leave you feeling really frustrated or you use the wrong word or you have trouble pronouncing something and someone doesn't understand you. Just these tiny things that you never have to think about. Um, I'm also somebody who's also always stressed about the future and what comes next and what am I going to do and how do I plan? And uh, just knowing that you have these additional difficulties like, oh, I can work for all these places. Oh, wait, they're not on this list of this very specific permit type that I need so they legally can't hire me I'm very frustrated by this um, so just those things like that that aren't smooth or easy um, because you're abroad but I think really going into what Nancy said uh, I think one of the biggest joys is not only learning a new language learning a new culture but also you just learn a lot about yourself and I think it really transforms you as a person it makes you I think a lot more self-sufficient and independent as a person 
um, because you don't have those little fallbacks of things that you're familiar to you and people who can always catch you if you need help or just knowing how to do something spontaneously. You really have to learn that from the ground up. It gives you a new appreciation for people who leave their countries. Although I come from a family of migrants, this is not strange to me, but it, it's just so different living that yourself versus hearing that. Um, and also just to a very small thing, it's very nice to, I can bike to both the uh, German and Belgian border. It's nice to be in three countries in one day and to take a train to go to X country and to go here and go there and just to have so many different experiences within a really small uh, amount of time. I think that's also just a very small thing that's different. And it's nice to meet new people that have a completely different outlook on life because they're shaped by a different history, a different geopolitical situation, a different language, a different culture. It is just, it really just changes your life in a lot of ways. And that's a huge benefit. Yeah, thank you all so much for that. I, I echo all of those things that studying, um, you know, studying and living abroad has made me more self-sufficient. I like that word. You know, I feel like I am a much more self-sufficient person after doing this. Um, and uh, to uh, to Oliver's point, I'm much more empathetic as well. Um, so I want to open the floor for some questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions for any of our lovely panelists, uh, feel free to write it in the chat box or um, get on mic, whatever you're more comfortable with. But I wanted to sort of leave a space for that uh, before we uh, we close out for today and, and Oliver can finally go to sleep because <laughs> I know it's late there. <laughs> Yeah, Allison. Hi, everyone. Um, I am happy to not take up more time but um, and let other people speak. But I did want to echo a couple of things um, that were said. And to say that I actually took a different path. So a lot of this sounds very familiar, but I took a different path and found a way to, to spend a year in an abroad context during my PhD, but without actually formally enrolling in a graduate school abroad. And it meant that it was easier for me to get a job in the United States, I guess, ultimately, or at least stay within the comfort zone, sort of. Um, but what I did find when I was um, technically enrolled in and, and had an advisor at the Econa Master Papier in Paris was that my dissertation project was very different from what the standards of a dissertation would be for a, like a says for a student in a French university. And so it was kind of hard for the advisor to guide me. And of course, my work was in English because I was getting a degree in, the, in a U.S. institution. And this was before the proliferation. I'm old enough to be before the proliferation of English language um, programs throughout Europe as part of Erasmus. Um but it was interesting thinking about ways in which if I had chosen a different path and instead just gone directly to France and had written my dissertation in French, it would have dictated a different path for me. It would have been a very different dissertation, but it still would have been such an interesting and enriching experience. And sometimes I kind of regret that I didn't do it that way. I mean, I don't because I don't try to live with regrets, but I think about the ways that it would have unlocked some really interesting paths in my life. And so just kudos to everybody who makes that choice, because I do think it does take a little bit of bravery. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that in addition to kind of self-sufficiency and um, and um, kind of knowing yourself a little better, I think it also puts in perspective, like when I think back on those little frustrations, like not knowing how to navigate how to navigate myself to my stupid like tuberculosis screening that I had to get to on the other side of Paris be like nowhere near where I live um and it seems so frustrating at the time like how do I do this or move this tv that I just bought like through the streets because <laughs> I don't I don't I didn't think ahead um but it I'm much better at saying this too shall pass and dealing with these small frustrations now yeah, here, I just say here. I just say today's struggles makes for a funny story tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for that, Allison. And I, I completely agree. I think that I had to deal with uh, UK council tax while I was there, and I didn't know if I had to pay council tax or not. And I remember crying every day for a week trying to figure out how UK government worked essentially. I had no idea. Um, and now I'm like, 
I can do my own taxes. I'm fine. I got this. I, I dealt with the council tax over there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I echo all of that. Well, it's about that time. Uh, but if anyone does in the future have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in contact with our panelists. Um, thank you all so much for participating and, and for giving your insight um, and, and all of your um, sort of wonderful experiences. Um, uh, good luck with your degrees. <laughs> Um, Nancy, good luck with meeting with all the PhD students. Yeah. We appreciate it. Um, so thank you all so much. And again, um, I will, I have recorded this session, so I'll send it out to everyone as well. So you have this information on hand.